Welcome to Wellbeing Wednesdays with Harvinder Narula of BW Wellbeing World. My guest today is Kiran Bedi, who was the first woman in India to join the officer ranks of the Indian Police Service, also known as the IPS, in 1972. And most recently was the 24th governor of Pondicherry until 2021. She's the one known to have brought reforms in the Indian jails and initiated skilling and educating inmates with the purpose to rehabilitate them and be included back in the society as reformed human beings. Let's talk to Kiran Bediji on the process of transformation that made jailed inmates acceptable members of our society. Welcome, Dr. Kiran Bediji. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Kiran Bedi, you know, you have played a very prominent role in law enforcement as well as in public services. And my belief is that someone who is purpose driven can do this job better than someone else who's doing it just for the sake of the work or the profession. Based on your experience, what advice would you have for individuals aspiring to make a positive impact in the communities that they're part of? My first thing is get into law enforcement only if you love it. Only if you are dedicated to it and you look forward to wearing your uniform and serving the people. If you put your heart in, if you have entered it with your heart and soul, you will constantly, constantly touch people's hearts. You will meet the purpose of the service. But if you've looked at it at a job as any, any employment, then you will, you will be a status quo. You'll play safe. You will never change things for the better. And you will probably even shun responsibility. So I would think, I would never advise, suggest, don't do this, whether it's armed forces. Uniform services, medical corps, you see, everywhere, anywhere you have a uniform, the uniform is, a, is not employment. Mm -hmm. It's a mission. Right. It's a seva. However, in that seva, you are being compensated. Mm -hmm. So it's not a business. Right. So uniform means something above you, higher than you, and give yourself to it. So therefore... I would say, if you join, my, my message would be, do not join. Then, Otherwise, if you want to make money, there's no uniform in business. Right. Business is suit, boot, whatever dress you want to wear. It's your flexibility. And go ahead and make as much money as you want. And money is a good thing. Right. Money is a good thing to earn. Rightly is a very good thing because that's what keeps, uh, keeps us all going. But when you come to uniform services, it's not the money. Mm -hmm. It's a service. It's the content. It's the other person, not you. Right. In business, it can be you and others. But in service, there's only others, not you. This is a very beautiful thing that you've said, you know, because a lot of people say that you turn your passion into a profession. But here you're turning your mission into a profession and you're getting the ability to be able to serve people, uh, you know, by being a part of them. And with a lot of responsibility. That's a very beautiful thought, uh, Dr. Karen Bedi. Now, throughout your career, uh, what were some of the most challenging situations that you had to go through? And how did you navigate them? For me, the challenge was only when the purpose was being distorted. Whether it is by seniors, whether it was other vested interests, or whether it was a part of your team. When the purpose for which you are is being um, robbed, diluted, traded, right? Compromised. This was my only challenge. No other challenge. And you have all kinds of people in the society. Everybody is in a uniform service, not for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. That's where the conflict arises. And how did you navigate these challenges? Because, I mean, you know, the roles that you have been in, uh, these would have been day in and day out. A huge amount of personal sacrifice. And mm -hmm. in personal sacrifice, I was sometimes never alone. I had my family sacrificing. 
Mm-hmm. I was never alone. I had some team members sacrificing. Mm-hmm. Not people. Team members, your personal life, personal selves, and mm-hmm. your family. These are your closest. They are the ones who give more to come over. So that's that because these are they are also your strength. Right. That's where they sacrifice. So I would say these were my challenges. But I could write these challenges because of this. But then when they got affected also. But uh, you know, uh, it can be very overwhelming when you are in these kind of situations trying to maneuver your way through the challenges that you face. And especially, you know, it's not just you. Like you said, it could be your family, your team members, etc. What kept you uh, motivated and be uh, to remain strong on the sense of purpose uh, in the various roles? Is being honest to myself because I have to live within myself. I first have to live with myself, right? And I can't lie to myself, right? right. I owe it to myself. I have a, if you have a very loud conscience, mm-hmm. you will never lie to yourself. Very so true. you will do, and that would mean sacrifice. But there were certain never compromise. Some com- things were never compromised. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. If I was directed to suspend somebody to risk re- to dis- to tide over a situation, I never did it. However, junior the officer was, or to tide over a situation, I make a false statement in a press conference or otherwise. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't do it. Right. Or to make a report to please somebody because they're my senior or somebody outside as a Western, I would not do it. So there have been many situations in my life where I only went by the call of my own conscience, my own conscience. And conscience never ever tells you to hurt somebody for at your own cost. It never does. It tells you to do what is right, what is ethically and morally right. right. I've seen the power of conscience. It's amazing. Now you may call it the voice of God. You may call it the voice of your teacher, your mentor or a blessing. I do not know. But conscience will always tell you to take the right path. And it will immaterial. Conscience does not tell you it does not argue with you. Mm-hmm. Conscience does not argue the cost. Conscience, those are thoughts. But conscience only tells you what is the right thing to do. And there are many situations in in fact, my only major conflict with my sometimes my seniors was when to become become expedient, people had to be sac- wanted to be sacrificed. I said, no, I'll sacrifice myself, but not my person who trusted me, whose leader I was, whose responsibility I was, who looks up to me. How can I say tuja? No, I will lead. So it can be a law and order situation. I also had many law and order situations and they were very threatening. Mm-hmm. I did not sacrifice anybody else. I led it. And then others took over. But I led it first. Similarly, when it came to uh, situations where to get over a judicial inquiry or another, suspend somebody, reinstate after one week, I said, no, not even for a moment. Mm-hmm. So those were my situations and it took, my, took me time to overcome or register a case against somebody who's done a risky job, courageously done, and somebody's hurt or injured or even died Mm -hmm. to register an FIR against that person and arrest him. So no, no, I wouldn't because he's done his duty. It's in the course of duty. He has to be defended, not not a subservience register, uh, arrest, and then discharge. No. I owe it to him to lead. So I think that's those are my challenges, which I always faced. And they any number, and they are all listed in my book, I dare. Right. And uh, Dr. Kiran Reddy, you know, when you are serving not just your superiors, but also your people who are looking up to you, your team members, do you think by demonstrating your consciousness and, uh, you know, remaining true to yourself and to your duty, you have been able to motivate them and turn them into someone like you? I never served my seniors. I never worked for them. I worked with them. Awesome. 
I have never served for, I've only served my service. My loyalty was towards the service, not, not to the, to the uh, individuals. I could respect them. I could regard them. I could listen to them, accept, uh, uh, listen to them if they are going by the ethics. But I never served them. That was the challenge. That was the challenge when the expectation was to serve them. Let's say person in political power mm -hmm. to serve them. I never did. Right. That's why I never went up to them for any, any change of postings. I got what, what was given. Mm -hmm. So had I served them, I could have done business with them. Okay. I served you, you served me. Yes. Since I never served anybody, I didn't serve them. How can I go back and say, now you will say, now you have done our work at that time, now why do you do it? So I have never asked, I have never given it. I have done what I have asked, which I have asked. Which I have asked, which I have asked. Which I have asked. Even the law has to be interpreted in an ethical way. Correct. Law, every law has a discretion. There is an element of discretion in the laws also in implementation. Mm -hmm. So you have to apply the law justly. Correct. Law does not say, mara to mara. No. You look at the circumstances and you uh, interpret the law. Then the courts can decide. So Correct. therefore, I have never served anybody. I have not served anybody. I have mm -hmm. only served my honored answer, my own conscience, and I served the service for which I came out of respect and that remained. There was never a compromise. If you see my latest book on uh, in uh, the, the fearless governance, when I worked as five years in Pondicherry as Lieutenant Governor, mm -hmm. it's an amazing story by itself. Did I serve the powers that be or did I serve the people? Right. And that was the whole challenge. Whole right. challenge of my five years was service to the people, service to Pondicherry, or service to powers that be. Right. So I think that's the point. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Kiran Bedi, you know, the one word that comes into my mind when I look at your journey is transformation. Because that's what you've always uh, focused on. Now, what does it take as a change maker to foster the faith in transformation? You know, and what triggered your initiation to consider transforming the inmates in the jail? If you're a leader, then what are you there for? If you don't change things for the better. And that's transformation. That's change. Transformation is then when it's very large scale, it transforms the organization, transforms the whole name or credit of an organization. It builds trust. So if you are don't transform things for the better, because things change, uh, new ideas are required. New old situations, old processes decay. So if you want the growth of an organization, you must continue to change for the better or sustain for the right thing. Even that is sometimes a challenge to sustain what was right. Because then you may not have had resources. You may not have had the skill. Or you may not have the rules and the laws to even sustain sometimes. Right. So sustain good practices is also a challenge. But change what is outdated, mm -hmm. what doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. But the question is, if you don't do this, then what are you there for? If you don't change things for the better, you are to lead people, you have to administer an organization, you have to serve people, you have to invisible. People are not who you're serving are not visible many times. They're the invisible, but they only get the benefit. They're sometimes direct transfers. These are called direct transfers of policies. The way currently we are directly transferring so many benefits to the direct bank accounts. So mm -hmm. are you getting to see each other? No, that's a benefit. That's transformation where you're making everybody getting out of poverty line, etc. The question is, if you don't, then you're not a leader. Mm -hmm. Then you're not a leader. But if you're in a leadership position, it's not a position, it's a responsibility. Right. It's a responsibility to change things for the better. For the cause of the organization, you are. Right. My prison assignment was exactly that. Change for the better. Mm -hmm. Why the cause of the uh, prison was reformation. Mm -hmm. Change of the cause of the prison is 
no escapes but mm-hmm. reform got it but if you stop at escape and not the reform then you are polluting the system you mm-hmm. are leaving problems for the future right. because when he leaves the prison he is going out revengeful angry mentally disturbed and he look for the next victim but if you guarded him well secured him well looked after him well and worked on his mind enabled facilitated where he changes he's reflective and he realizes his error then you are make a safer society what is the objective of the prison management is safe society right. what is the objective of policing is a safe society so all that makes you safer is the objective so, and if you are in a leadership position to deliver this that's your responsibility so you will go take every direction every decision which makes for a healthier safer society right so dr kiran bedi you know I, i want to ask you that when you were looking at these reforms in the prison and this were through transforming the mindset of the inmates did you believe or do you believe that every one can be transformed or did you come to a situation where you said you know these are the kind of people that can be transformed and inka kuch nahi ho sakta every one of us has been gifted the same mind it's the way you use it all of us you are not born a criminal the mind becomes criminal later and they become criminals we have who becomes a criminal who i think i, I there are three e's which shiv khera's book says in we can win you can win the word is you can win uh, he says three e's make the difference in a person's life first e is education second e is experience and third e is environment we are all product of three e's who are those people who gone in they lost out on education or they had very severely bad experiences or they had a fallen into bad environment which could be bad company or circumstances those of us who evolved out of this earth been away are those who valued education who had a very healthy environment at home to grow right and they also had naturally better experiences these are the people who came into the prisons or in policing when i was arresting them my a love for reform and change did not start with the prison actually got exposed in the prison my love for reform started from my policing day one the whoever i arrested for years and years in new delhi police i used to first thing go and talk to that prisoner so a person accused accused who was used to be in police lockups every day in the morning as a dcp of a district my first thing was once i get my day diary and know who has been arrested for what my task was to go to that police station and he was in police custody and he would be in the lockup i will talk to him in the lockup say ye crime tumne kyun kiya i wanted to understand the reason and believe me they fell into one of these three e's or they fell into all the three e's why did i they i want i was a basically a sociologist at heart a criminologist at heart why and i was a preventer at heart i wanted to work strategies on crime prevention how do i prevent crime if i do not know the reasons so i would know the reason why how can i do better policing whether how can i do going for better ensure that parents so sociological reasons there was a failure of parents there was a failure of schooling and there was a failure of friends friends means which friends then i would find out which friends because he's going to go back to the same friends so we'll round up all those friends also and start working on them so when he goes back they also get so i get to know whether it's friends or it's drugs or it's personal it's emotional that means emotional means imbalanced education and imbalanced parenting so i would get to know understand why and then of course he would tell me the truth best part of my being a woman and asking him tumne ye kyu kiya he looked at me as a sister and a brother as a human being are a police officer dcp of a rank mujhe puch rahe hai pyar se puch rahe hai tumne maar nahi rahe mujhe 
ने बता था कि नहीं बता था अरे तुमने बता दे ये चाकू तुमने रखा तुमने कहा से लिया और वाई वुड आई सी बिकॉज दो प्लांट नाइव यूज टू प्लांट नाइव टू पुट एम अंडर राम एक्ट अर्लियर डेज दे यूज टू बी प्लांटेड नाइव टू पुट एम अंडर राम एक्ट Oh, we recovered a knife from him. Which knife? You planted it. He said, "Ma'am, I have not done it. This is what they did. This knife was thrown on me. But where there were truthful cases, he said, 'Yes, ma'am, I did it. I bought it from such and such place. I got it for this for this reason of revenge, right? So I would try and understand. There, with the result, none of my police officers dared to plant a false knife because they knew she would go and ask." so false cases from policing days stop going to the courts and if my case of uh, knife arms act or a weapon recovery would go to the district courts of tisazari or those days the courts believed us because they knew that north district or west district which were i was in charge would not make false uh, cases we earned the trust of the courts so my whole objection was to find out the why why of his crime and the why fell into one of the three e's so that is when i went to the prisons i start to know the why the why was very evident so i start to address education i start to address clean up the environment and i start to give them an experience of meditation vipassana and then uh, brahmachari the uh, di spiritual discourses spiritual festivals all that was to meet the three e's Right. so it was learning much earlier in policing before it went into prisons prisons it became very evident it was transformative because at 10000 people right and in policing it was one here two there five here two here and it was spread out it was not all together but right. the in prisons it became transformation because of the numbers and the environment was controlled i had a very controlled safe environment now no drugs could come in even smoking was banned we had taken away all smoking from the prison no cigarettes were sold no smoking so there was smoking was a very big change when we did no so that was transformative why for better health care right i have to ban smoking because tuberculosis was increasing right and i can't be making them educate themselves how can i have a healthy environment in smoking i cannot so wow. see the three e's was the major transformation reason always when it came to prisoners or a criminal angle so policing reform transformative policing or crime prevention had started in policing career right away because the purpose was safe society right so at this what i was doing so you know so transformation <clears throat> doesn't happen without without getting the cause the root cause right so you know two very beautiful things come out of it you know one is you know and it's is important for people to understand that one person's action can actually transform the system kyunki hum log hamesha system ko galat thehrate hain but the fact that you said that the 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 courts you started believing so you earned their uh, trust in you that you know whatever you were presenting was correct so you know it proves that you know efforts waste nahi jaate second was that you know it was transformation there's a science behind it the fact that you have identified that you know these were the three e's and try to address that to transform it was not a blind effort ki just because mere ko passion hai shauk hai it was very scientifically uh, planned so you know those are two things that really uh, come very strongly out of this you also mentioned that you know when you would go and meet the prisoners at least the, the not the prisoners but the accused and you would talk to them at as a, uh, a lady police officer there would be there was some kind of an empathy because of which they would open up to you apart from this because you were the first woman officer in the ips who took on the uniform what were the challenges that you faced because you know this was the first time that a lady officer was coming in the officer rank challenges were uh, change of mind acceptance acceptance by the seniors of a different way of doing got it there was a lot of resistance from many of my colleagues mm -hmm. and seniors because my approach was preventive right their approach was arrest approach right detection detect i'm not saying prevent and detect 
I'm not saying no detection, but detect to prevent. Right. I didn't stop at detection. I think it was the question of my peers and seniors, because my whole approach was prevention. But that did not mean I would let detection get out of my hand. Right. I would detect. And but purveyor work in such a way that he does not get criminalized further. Right. Right. So to detect, to prevent. Got it. Got it. So therefore, whereas mine was prevention most of the time, but detections, it policing stops at detection. Right. Policing stops at detection. It, it is detect and punish. Mine hmm. was detect, punish, and also prevent. There was one more P I added. Right. There was a difference in approach. That's why many times they say, uh, when prisons, when prison reforms were happening, mm -hmm. there was no peer support from outside in the Delhi police. There was mm -hmm. no peer support. They'd say what she's doing, she's making prisons so easy and comfortable that crime will increase in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge opposition. Right. There was a vested interest which was opposing it. Mm -hmm. And I do remember that, um, do you know what turned, turned the tables? The Ramon Maxis Award. When that award came, which was a which was a surprise and a shock to the to the service as a whole, mm -hmm. that how can she as IG prison, she's not fired any terrorists, she's not done any encounters, mm -hmm. and she's getting a Ramon Maxis Award, which is called the Peace Award. Right. The Peace Award came because I was putting them at peace. Right. Thousands of them. Thousands of them were being at, brought to a level of peace so that they don't go back and disturb the peace of the society. And it's a fact. Research after research proved people. I'll give you an example how it, I, it proves it. Mm -hmm. Earlier, when I used to walk around the prisons, I used to walk, talk to the prisoners and say, um, they were very close-knit groups. You know, they were gangs. They were very good friends. They were friends inside prisons and in the very close friends. So I used, to, I used to ask them earlier. I said, so if this person goes, uh, would you not miss him? He's your friend. Because I used to be a very, I used to communicate a lot. Because I'm exploring again, you know. I'm trying to understand their mind. He says, yes, ma'am, we'll miss him. Then after, after the reforms started to happen, then I said, and they were all into education. They were into many programs as time went by. Then I said, so... ऑफ़ After all the uh, investments we were making into social reform programs, so that's you see, it was a perfect time for research, but nobody did research. There was an organization called Bureau of Police Research and Development, which prisons is a part of research. Nobody did the research. Then what's going on? Why is it going on? Till now, there's no research. This is unnecessary. We underestimate our own work. We undermine our own capability. We don't believe in our own originality and innovation. We don't believe it. We only feel jealous. We only find fault. And at that time, it was a. I was inviting universities to come and research. Research what is happening, what is helping. I wanted medical research because there were all diseases there. I wanted psychology research. There were all issues of psychology there. There was sociological research, criminological research, medical research available. Sociology from criminology, crime prevention angle. You had every answer. 10,000 prisoners, each one would be able to give you perfect, pure data at one stage. You could have had the purest PhDs from my PhD time at that time. Purest. I was inviting. People were not understanding. Government was not understanding. I went on regardless. That is the reason, by the way, I applied for a Nehru Fellowship, Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship, and I wrote that book, It's Always Possible, because I knew 
that's the only way I can document this legacy in research and, and this uh, transformative model. So what I'm saying is that this is what is not valued. And had it happened in the West, this would have probably been offered as a model. And do you know not a penny was spent in that program? None of the programs cost the government any money. It was mm -hmm. all done by collective work, collective right. uh, generation. So therefore, I would say that uh, it real challenges were to go on doing this without any support. And why did not anybody interfere? Because nobody's interested in prison. Nobody's interested. Why right. should we? And nobody's interested in posting there. So they may not even had a replacement. So they left it at as if. And the day it evolved, they got the Raman Maxisse Award, and the invitations start to come from the world over, including invitation from Bill Clinton for a prayer breakfast meeting. I was taken to the coals saying, why have you been invited? Hame kyun nahi bulaye ga? Tumko ki Washington bulaye ga? I said, you please ask them, why are you asking me? Mm -hmm. And suddenly, I was one day asked to get out of the prison world, saying enough is enough. So you were saying challenges? Transformation does disturb uh, balances, moves out Western. It does not go into the mindsets of people. While I went on because I believed that was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. What else am I here for? I'm not a guard. Then I should rather be on the tower. I'm a guardian and I'm a parent. I have to change change things for the better. So challenges were, how do you continue to drive the change despite peer opposition? Right. Uh, very interesting things, is by, by the way, when I got the Maxisi Award, do you know who did not celebrate? Delhi police. They did not celebrate. Somebody, after a month or so, a small group of two, three friends, went and went and met the senior saying, sir, countrywide, she's getting invitations to come and speak about her award and tell us. We mm -hmm. haven't even celebrated the Delhi police, has not even come together to celebrate the Maxis Award. After all, she's a Delhi police officer who's got this award mm -hmm. ever before and after. And then after a month and a half of pros and cons, they had a very mild uh, get together. There was no celebration. So this is what is except I'm not complaining. I understand and understand why it happens. Because now there was so much of a good name which was coming, which was hitting into the eye of many people. So there's nothing but pure jealousy, envy. Right. Now, when it comes to transformation, one is the support from the peers, which you did not get, obviously. But the other thing is the self-belief of the people who are being transformed or where, where the effort of transforming them is. Uh, did you find the, the sense of self-belief among these people that you were trying to transform? Just let me conclude with the earlier question was, yeah, I, I had a very good thought. Huh? It was outside peer envy. Inside it was all teamwork. My God, the amount of teamwork I had, wherever I have transformed, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So what has made me succeed everywhere I've gone for, tra with, for transformation is not the external help from the peers or the department. It's from the internal teamwork. Right. So therefore, I am a product of strong teamwork. And because they happen to be a notch junior. Mm -hmm. Once they started to believe in what I was doing, they loved it. And they took on and carried forward. So I'm product of all these prison or police reforms because of my very few team members, which it's all ranks. So that 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 was the real strength. Support system as we came from internal. internal. Now your question, how whether who were beneficiaries did they did they, your the belief in them for being it uh, changed. changed. It started to change. They start to realize this is how they can also think. Because I think there is a humanity everybody's within. It's suppressed. You just have to awaken it by, uh, by an environment, by an experience, by education. And then we provided all the three E's inside, whether it was in policing, we, in, we did, or in prisons, 
it started to change the change the way they looked. This at somewhere they came into a conflict zone, and somewhere they crossed the line. So from negativity they came into ambivalence, and from ambivalence to clarity. So there's a twilight zone. All of them were at different stages. All of them, as they came, I noticed because whoever you started to talk, talk to, and connect with them, and to start logically, ethically uh, answering questions, I think it did prick in. It did sink in. So I would think it's worth the effort always. Right. There were many, many examples of where they changed. Many, many changed in the inside the prison or outside the prison, where there was a policing. Many, many changed. Mm -hmm. And they became turned around. So the examples, and by the way, many of them got employed also after they left in some of my NGOs. Lovely, lovely. And uh, uh, Dr. Vedi, uh, you know, you have a background in sports. You were an avid mm -hmm. tennis player. Mm -hmm. Do you think sports and physical activities contribute to an overall uh, well-being besides just the physical well-being, the mental well-being and, uh, and personal growth? that help you achieve these otherwise seemingly tough tasks? If we start our schools with sports, yoga, and spiritual gravity, education can follow. In fact, we are the other way around. Theory can follow sports. Because sports builds camaraderie. Right. Sports cheers you up, opens you up. You laugh, you play, you are healthy, right? And you team up. You learn to lose, but you don't hate the winner. And you prepare to win again, right? And you still share the glory because it's a teamwork. Supposing our school started with the games and then say, okay, now breakfast, now breakfast. now I think things will dramatically change. But we keep sports as last when you don't even have a time period. I think we've gone. What happened in my life? Mm -hmm. And so start with tennis in the morning as right. a student before, because I was into competitive tennis. Mm -hmm. How did I mean by sometimes I could just go into fitness because I had to do my jogging. I had to do my fitness before I went to school. And then from school, I went to tennis straight mm -hmm. to the tennis courts to play and then go home to do my homework. And even do homework on the tennis court, waiting for my turn. Mm -hmm. What did I learn in my life? Value every minute of my life. Right. I was healthy. I was hungry. And I was joyful. Because right. I had nothing else to stress on. It was all play. It was family. It was friends. It was activities. It was nature. It was all outdoor. And also then school. Both. So when you combine both, I think the real education is done. That's a very beautiful perspective, uh, Dr. Bedi. Now, uh, can you provide some insights into the connection between faith in transformation and the resilience that you need to make it happen? You know, because just believing that you want to transform just does not do the magic. Well, belief is also your inner confidence. That you believe in yourself. You see, one is metaphysical belief. One is inner belief. Metaphysical belief comes later. Inner belief comes first. And metaphysical belief comes in later. It gets added on. Because when nature sees you doing your very best, it steps in. It steps in to strengthen you. Because it's karma. You're doing all the time the best karma. Why would you lose? If your karma or your effort or your hard work has been completed by own belief that I have belief and wanting a, a want. You want to do, you develop a belief, I can do. It's a thinking. I can be the champion. I can talk. I can help. I can help. So I can comes here in your strength mind and then it leads to action. And your I can and the intensity of I can puts you the maximum effort. And when the maximum effort comes, nature comes to help you. How does nature help you? You sometimes get a good coach. 
Sometimes you get a scholarship. Sometimes you get a great um, appreciation and a medal. That's when nature comes. You sometimes get a right kind of a position or a place. That's when nature comes. You didn't ask for it. It came because of your effort. So it starts with the spirit of I can and I want to and I must get it. So you do it. The more you put in, the greater the result. And the karmic philosophy is correct. The more it's like jinnah good pauge, una mitthaoega. You know, it's a it's a very beautiful thought because this uh, you know kind of relates to the what people call the law of attraction as well. That if you really truly believe that you can do what you wish to do and you have the ability to do it, the the universe will make it happen for you. You know, it will give you all the tools to make it happen. You know, very beautifully uh, you brought this out, uh, Doctor Berry. Now, in your opinion, what role does governance play? in promoting the overall well-being and development of the society you look at well governed municipality you look at well governed policing you look at well governed administration you look at well governed leadership and you also look at bad governance what's happening i think neighborhood is next door what's happening in the neighborhood what's happening in our neighborhood over the years governance was priorities of governance were different it was not the well being of the people but the well being of the few and the well being of the few proceeded over the well being of the larger good so what's happened others are suffering the uh, basics are missing or they're very highly expensive they cannot afford so good governance is all about where people who have been tasked the responsibility they fulfill it with honesty and integrity and their maximum skill if they don't have the skill they get the skill because the purpose is larger good so when larger good is good governance larger good is good governance it does not happen the good governance will not have its challenges but all the decisions you take despite challenges you keep the larger good in mind and bad governance is when your own good proceeds over the larger good or the group of the oligarchy not democracy oligarchy oligarchy is good of the few but democracy is good governance is when it larger good now it may be major it can be larger good but it also can be sometimes a conflict where larger good may be demanding something wrong but then you take a decision that this is not in the long term good then you are a visionary then good governance also takes risks to plan ahead for the years that's also challenges of good governance good governance is not only to oblige majority when they may be wanting something wrong no ethically is not right so larger good based on ethics and long term good long term planning what this is this is again very very important because you know what it brings out is the mindfulness and the intent of the people who are who have the responsibility of governance you know that's that's very very important for a society for a well uh, developed society or developing society yes now when we are talking of society dr kiran bedi uh, you know when you look at the reforms in the prison for example when we are transforming the inmates and we are uh, addressing the three e's that you spoke of the whole idea is for them to go out without being angry on what the society has done with them or what the environment has played a role in them for them to get accepted in the society but how do we create an environment so that these people can be gainfully employed when we are living in an environment where every company requires you to get a police certificate for criminal records etc so how do you manage the environment so that these people can be accepted back into the society and be given jobs as we did we prepared them for release is preparing people saying ek din to jana hai what will you do what will you do so then we made them identify what they were already skilled at so we made the skill rather than the kill so we made the skill and not kill so 
sharpen your skill, but not the kill. Then we opened computer centers. Many, many things we did. Skills development happened in prison at that time. National Open School was opened at that time. Indira Gandhi National Open University was opened at that time. Computer centers were opened at that time. And many other trades for them to skill. And that was preparation for release. But we also told them, you're not going to be accepted for day, from day one. So don't anticipate. You're on bail and probation. People will judge you for the next six to months to one year. If you go back, face onslaught, face the beatings, face the accusations, but keep saying, and continue to skill, people will accept it. So we prepared them for release to prepare for the brickbats. Mentally, Ma'am, accept No, I'm not saying that. You are on probation. When you are released, you are on probation of good health. Your family will start saying, no, no, he has changed. Badal ke aaya. People will start saying, ye badal ke aaya, isko de do. So preparation for release is also part of reform. So that is a very important aspect for people to be mentally strong to accept the naysayers. Initially, that's, right. you know, that's very that's very important aspect. But how do we prepare a society to start believing in the concept that you know people who have had the criminal background in the past can be transformed? They can be trusted. Give them an opportunity. How can we prepare the society to uh, act on this? I think the national messages with the countries at the moment going through. Har ghar taranga. They did not change. Swach, Swach Bharat, they did not change. Sometimes by compulsion, sometimes by support, sometimes volitionally. That means leadership has a role to give national messages time to time. And there are many need for many, many such national messages. Otherwise, they'll not be transformative. Water harvesting, be a national message. Planting trees, be a national message. Character building be a national message. Social service be a national message. Playing sports be a national message. See, these were national messages, but they are not done. They're not chased because it's left to the states. It's then left to the states. Then it's left to the districts. Then it's left to different collectors who may, be, who may or may not do. So some collectors, Few get awarded on the civil services day because they carry through. But why not others? If one collector can do that, why not others? They are employed only for that. If one collector can do such great water harvesting in his village or in his district, why can't others? You are employed for that. In fact, you should be tasked, why haven't you done it? One collector's good work should become exemplified and uh, replicated elsewhere. And they should be trained, say, now you do this. He should be an example and a trainer for all the rest. Today, we would not have had problems of water harvesting in India if all collectors could have done their work. And collectors asking for local help, corporate help, voluntary help, NGO help is not a problem at all. But if the collectors of this India, maybe 300 of them, whatever their number is, if they similarly work, and implement these programs, and they are not political. Mm -hmm. Water harvesting is not political. Planting trees is not political. Playing right. sports is not political. And many other programs, uh, create, uh, going, not going outdoor for toilets is not political. It benefits mm -hmm. all. Where's the politics in this? Right. And then problem is, when a uh, politician goes and asks for it, then he wants a transaction. So they don't believe him. But collector has no transaction to do. Collector will come and go. He has no, no, nothing to ask for. Right. But if the collector connects with these people local and takes them along, and if they go along, very good. If they don't go along, their problem. Right. I did this exactly in Pondicherry. I tasked the collectors to work. Mm -hmm. And when I used to go and see the collector and appreciate him, the local politician hated me for it. 
They said, ma'am, it's not your job. And he told the collector is not his job. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they wanted a transactional yeah. give and take. And that's why nothing happened. So what happened was the collector then connects with the colleges, connects with the corporates and took their help and did water harvesting, created many new lakes in Pondicherry and tanks of water harvesting. It was a collector because people trust the collector because they know collector is not going to ask anything in return. India can be a revolution through its collectorate and the superintendent of police. Two people can play a very major role in India's transformation. Collector to coordinate the district administration and the superintendent of police raise the security, involve the people in community policing, the panchayats, the mela mandas, the sarpanches, the youth clubs. They can all become youth cadets in safety. See, so here again, superintendent is not political. The two non political positions in India, if they remain oriented towards their own task, and they are assessed for that. And if one superintendent has done this good practice, it should be known as a common practice. Keep that means one good practice is a practice for all. That becomes a model for everyone else. That's a model for all. And he should be judged on that. Right. That's what not happened. We have few who stood out, but they remained few. Why not others? And now what me what does it mean? That means a collector is afraid if I go, MLA might get annoyed. Why should he be afraid? Why should he be afraid? He only to keep him on the side, he does not go out in the field and involve the people. See, so he's afraid. Afraid of what? You are there only for a year or two. You will go. But he's afraid he wants to stay on even for those two years. Otherwise, he might get transferred after one year only. Just for that one year to stay on, he sacrifices the value of his work. Right. So I think if the Indian the communities can be mobilized only through these non-political positions today, not political only, right. but these non-political positions should make the endeavor to take the politician along. If he does not go, you go on regardless. If he goes, it's a very good. Then it makes life much faster and easier. When we are talking of fostering empathy and acceptance by the society, are there some examples of people who have moved out of prison but have been very gainfully accepted by the society and they have made a change that you would like to share with us? There are many examples now. I have many examples. You see, that's where research is about. That's what organizations like Bureau of Police Researchers and Development or Criminology Researchers or Social Sciences Researchers should go and research. But there's no investment into research. And there are many examples today. I have many examples because I work with them. My India Vision Foundation exactly does that. And I have a whole data. I have a whole data where they are all now working and they are becoming productive. Somebody is in music. So we have music therapy. They've started being musicians. Somebody is a painter. He's doing commercial art. Somebody is a stitching and tailor. He's doing that. Somebody is a barber. He's doing that. Somebody is in agriculture. He's gone as gardeners. Somebody has got learned computer. He's doing software. I have all this data with me. India Vision Foundation has it. Somebody has to come back and see the benefits of these. They are there. Nothing is a waste. And uh, Dr. Kiran Bedi, my last question to you is, do you have a message for the society uh, so that, you know, the approach, the mindset, because I think, you know, what is coming out of this conversation is that whether it is the govern- governance or whether it is the society, whether it is the people who are getting reformed, it is the mindset that we need to change. It's That's what we need to work on. So how can we focus on rebuilding relationships than, uh, and giving strength to these people rather than solely working towards punitive measures? Look, the unit of transformation is family. Right. And the school. School changes, the entire population of that school changes. Family changes, the whole population of the the children. It's a village. So school transformation has to come through units. Unit means, that means parenting. I think where we are failing is parenting. We are letting children grow on their own, 
unmentored, unmonitored, particularly boys. Particularly a boys, and they are forming the society of crimes against women. Right. Similarly, boys are in school. Every dropout child must be traced back and brought back to school. Why aren't the teachers doing that? Mm -hmm. Every family, the father must play a proper role. At the moment, fathers are letting you letting this country down, not mothers. When they start to feel that they are only providers, khana dena mera kaam baaki nahi hai, baaki to maa ka kaam hai. But child needs not only food and shelter, child needs growth. Child needs nurturance, mental, physical and spiritual. Why isn't the fathers of this country are neglecting their boys and boys are neglecting their parents and they're on the streets and that's your society today. That's why women are unsafe. Right. And that's why it's not spiritual, not value based. Values have to come from schools, teachers, teachers, and the grooming has to come from parents. All parents of the village, all schools of the area, that's transformation. Right. Uh, Dr. Kiran Devi, you know, I'm, I'm very intrigued by what you just said. And uh, I, I want to, I wish to ask you one more question that comes to my mind now. Since you just spoke about fathers, in fact, it is about parents. And one thing that has changed in our society, at least in India, is something that is very prevalent, is the diminishing gap between your work life and your personal life. Right? We are working very long hours. And because of the technology in our hands, we are working beyond hours. And we feel that, you know, we are actually being true to what we really want to do. But we are compromising on the time that our family, our children need from us. Do you think this is one thing that needs to transform? And if yes, what do you think? What is your opinion? What is it that we need to do? Because house, house management is being left to the woman. We have not grown up as a home. Where all play their parts. So elders play their role, children play their role, mother plays a role, and a father plays a role. No, it's a working woman plays a role. The only change, why is work life balance coming? Because a woman is now stepped out to work. So that's why, otherwise, where was the where was the work life balance when my mother was not working outside the home and daddy would play and come back, etc.? Where was the well imbalance? We were all home. The imbalance has come because the woman has stepped out. Now who manages the who manages in between when she's not there? And what does she do when she comes back? She's also exhausted like anybody else. Why isn't it a home? The point here is we have not groomed our boys to become homemakers as well. When the woman is also coming back home, Man is also coming back home. They again manage their home together. And children have grown up also to help their parents. They are not there. Their children are not there. There's no dinner together. They don't eat together. Children are out with their friends till late. God knows when they'll come, particularly boys. And girls also it's taking big risks. And the father, when he comes, now he wants to be served. The way he was when mother was not working. That's a problem. So we talk of work-life balance because of this imbalance in our own mind. Today, a woman stepped out to become a second income for the house because the expenses demanded. And number two, her education work wants an expression. Right. The key is, and if elders are there, why can't elders also step in? Right. Elders, I have elders say, why? Why can't it be the same home, extended family? The breakdown of the extended family has weakened a working woman a lot. Mm -hmm. And the working woman doesn't get the support from her working husband. Right. And the children also demand from her. So she's still the same old mother who was not working but at home. Now she's working, but she's not at home all the time. Right. So I think work-life balance has got imbalanced because of a breakdown of our value systems of the family and secondly the growth of the uh, upbringing of the son and the man 
rather than saying we both are working now we both third is the concept of eating eating together has gone right where the, if dinners are eaten together where parents have a children have a timeline to say this is the time we all eat together nobody goes out after that home and there are no extended dinners dinner hai to weekend mein karenge working day mein no dinners no outside dinners no extended we will celebrate the weekend also together that right. will bring a family harmony right there's a work life imbalance there's no balance you are now celebrating work and you're celebrating home there's the imbalance very true so i think you know what you 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 actually uh, hit the nail on the head because i think you know when we call ourselves life partners we truly need to be partners and not uh, you know and we need to redefine our roles i think uh, we need to break those mindset barriers and the belief systems that we have grown up with because the environment has changed and we need to rethink now uh, dr kiran baidi thank you so much for your time you know there are a lot of things that i have personally taken away from this conversation you know the point that you made that transformation is not just changing for the better though that is the underlying statement but it is also to sustain what is right that is also extremely important and you know you're explaining the three e's that shiv khera talks of uh, created a lot of context to why the crime is happening and what needs to be addressed than just by loosely saying that you know we need to transform people you need to figure out why what caused that thing and fulfill that gap to make things uh, change and uh, the 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 statement that i took away was replace skill with the kill and you know that is skill. replace no more kill. kill with the skill skill replace but no more kill no more kill you know with these takeaways i can only say gratitude to you for taking our time because you know this conversation is actually itself transformative for anybody who listens to it carefully contextualizing to their own life thank you so much you very, very nice meeting very nice talking to you arvind likewise man thank you so much